verses 16, 13, and 14. It's a significant name. I definitely wanted to include it. The name is El Roy, and it means the God who sees. What made it significant to me was that this was in the midst of human circumstances, very, very human. God had given a promise to Sarah and Abraham, but Sarah fell back on the ancient custom of securing an heir through a slave girl on her behalf. She was too impatient to wait for God's timing. She thought she needed to help him out. On page 19 in our books, question five, it asks us to describe a time when you thought God did not see your need and you were tempted, and maybe did, take matters into your own hands. We've all done it at one time or another. I just seem never to learn. I did it again and again. So what happened? Never comes out like we think it will. It's always best to wait for God's timing. Question six, of us who run ahead of God's timetable and means of blessing, asks, how have you seen God's mercy emerge from your bungled attempts to be in charge? Hagar was a slave. She was also a victim in the custom of the day, and she was seen by God. He assured her that the blessing for Sarah and Abraham extended to her. She was under an umbrella of blessing that included her. She had to go back. She had run away because she had gotten proud and haughty and had angered her mistress, and she was somehow abused and ran off into the desert. She would not have lasted there. She would not have lived there, but that was where God spoke to her and told her that he had seen everything and that what she needed to do for her own preservation and the babies was to go back to her mistress, to submit herself to her authority, et cetera, et cetera. But she had to go back and accept her life as it was. But can you imagine the experience of knowing that God on high had seen her and her plight and was watching over her? Surely that had an impact on her life. Second Chronicles 16.9 says, The eyes of the Lord move about on the earth on all the earth, to strengthen the heart that is completely toward him. You'll notice in most of the catastrophes of the world, God always looked for however many were faithful to him that he might save and preserve them. Here are some of the faults that are part of this package. Abraham listened to his nagging wife when he should have insisted that they both wait upon God. Sarah, as Anne Spangler says, forced God's hand by taking matters into her own. She thought the timetable wasn't trustworthy. Hagar got haughty and her actions brought her grief, but the faithful God who sees all things set things straight. Because his nature is to be merciful and forgiving. He sees us. He sees us with compassion because he truly, truly cares. And because we know this, and we know that there's a verse that says he never slumbers and sleeps, Psalm 121, 3 and 4. He sees us in our lonely nights. You know, the older I get, the nights get longer. We have some reason less sleep. We have more aches and pains. We have things that we're thinking about for our children and our grandchildren and the world. God sees all of those lonely nights. I want to read Psalm 103. By the way, we read that at our wedding. That was our wedding chapter. 
Psalm 103, verses 10, 11, and 13. I'm intentionally skipping 12 because we're going to see that in another portion. God does not treat us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. We don't get what we deserve in any way, shape, or form with God. People want to say he's always waiting to up there to just knock us down and, and punish us, but he's not. He's looking to show us mercy. He's looking to show us compassion, if we will just turn to him. For as high as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who, who fear him. 13 says, like a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord gives compassion to those who fear him. That so is very important because it's saying in the same way, like a father or a mother shows compassion to your children. Your children always do right. Do they make mistakes? Do they disobey you? Do they frustrate you sometimes? Yes, but we're always looking to set things right, to set things straight with them. And God, in a magnificent way, does the same. I thought we'd have some fun considering some contrasting names for Jesus. So I selected two, Lamb of God and Lion of Judah. I'm going to read a section for you here that where Ann Spangler describes what we're talking about. Most of us picture lambs as downy white animals, so cute, frolicking in rolling green meadows or carried tenderly in the arms of their shepherd. All of that's true. Lambs represent gentleness, purity, and innocence. And I am told that in uh, Jewish thought, lambs, their purity, they were supposed to pick the best of the best, also signifies on the side of the person who is using it um, as a symbol of understanding the nature of sin and how they have to be forgiven through the blood. It also shows that they have good intentions. Most of us don't go out and plan robberies are <laughs> do terrible things. We, we really mean to be good, but it's just impossible sometimes with our sin nature and our tendencies and our selfishness. But lambs represent gentleness, purity, and innocence. That's why they were used to, uh, to, to be sacrificed. Though it is one of the most tender images of Christ in the New Testament, the phrase Lamb of God would have conjured far more disturbing pictures to those who heard John the Baptist hail Jesus with these words in John 1.29. Many of them at one time or another carried one of their own lambs to the altar to be slaughtered as a sacrifice for their sins. A lamb that they may have fed and bathed, the best animal in their small flock was to be picked. Hadn't the bloody sacrifice of an innocent animal provided a vivid image of the consequences of transgressing the Mosaic law? Surely John must have shocked his listeners by applying the phrase Lamb of God to a living man. When we pray to Jesus as the Lamb of God, we're praying to the one who voluntarily laid down his life to take in his own body the punishment for our sins and the sins of the entire world. It says in Isaiah 53, 7, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and a sheep before her shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. He didn't say, Pilate was amazed. He didn't say anything to try to get out of his predicament. He accepted the fact that this was inevitable, that he needed to do this for you and for me. 
John gave testimony. He saw the Spirit come down. He knew this was God's Son. And it was the next day that he said as Jesus passed by, Look, the Lamb of God. To the Jews, the Lamb represented innocence and gentleness because the sacrifice was meant to represent the purity of intention of the person or people who offered it. Lambs had to be without physical blemishes. It also showed how important God was to them. Really, are you going to give him your outcast? The New Testament uses two Greek words for Christ as the Lamb or Lamb of God, Arnion and Amnos Tau Theau. The phrase Lamb of God is found only in John's Gospel, though Jesus is often referred to as the Lamb in the book of Revelation, where he's portrayed as the Lamb who, though slain, yet lives and reigns victorious. In fact, 29 of the 34 New Testament occurrences of Lamb are in Revelation, a book so named, at least in part, because of what it reveals about who God is. The New Testament also refers to Christ's followers as lambs, tenderly loved. When the temple was destroyed in A.D. 70, animal sacrifices could no longer be offered. Most Jews today no longer eat lamb during the Passover meal or Seder. Instead, they place a roast lamb shank bone on a Seder plate as a reminder of the sacrifice. This by Anne Fangler. This passage describes Jesus' once for all sacrifice as the Lamb of God in power and victory. It's in Revelation 5, verse 6 and 9 and 10. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center before the throne encircled by the four living creatures and the elders, and they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take a scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased for God members of every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. The next time you're tempted to wallow in guilt over some sin or failing, remember that the Father has paid an impossibly high price to redeem you. Don't make the mistake of acting as if it wasn't enough. Instead, ask God's forgiveness and then turn your thoughts to the Lamb that he provided. Praise Jesus Christ himself and thank him for being willing to spend his last drop of blood to save you. We must remember that our sin is not greater than the power of the cross. Once you turn to Christ as your Savior, he saves completely and forever. There's a song that I love, and it's a response to a man who is remembering past regrets, past sin. And he's feeling really down, and he decides because he's feeling so badly, he needs to repent and ask God to forgive him again. And when he does, God's response to him was, What sin? Psalm 103, 12 says, As far as the east is from the west, they never meet. So far has he removed our transgressions from us. The Lion of Judah So, instead of a cutesy comparison of a lion and a lamb, we now understand that it is two images of power, two sides of a coin. There's a descriptive passage that Anne has in our book. Sorry. We had a little technical glitch, and we're overriding this, so be patient with us. Only once in the New Testament is Jesus described as a lion. The book of Revelation portrays the risen Christ as the only one worthy to open the scroll that contains the ultimate unfolding of God's purposes for the world. 
The Apostle John perceived Jesus as both lion and lamb, who through his death and resurrection becomes the ultimate victor and conqueror. When you pray to Jesus as the lion of the tribe of Judah, you're praying to the one with the power to banish all fear, to the one who watches over you with his fierce protecting love. You are also praying to the one who is the judge of the living and the dead. There is an awesome, fearful awesomeness about this, but not once we've dealt with our sin issue with God himself. Judah, in Genesis 49, 8 through 10, when the 12 tribes were getting their blessings, Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down to you. You are a lion's cub, Judah. You return from the prey, my son. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down. Like a lioness, who dares to rouse him? The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he comes to whom it belongs, and the obedience of the nations is his. Jesus was fulfillment of this prophecy from all the way back in Genesis. Revelation depicts the risen Christ as the mightiest of all victors. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah, the one found worthy to open the scrolls of history. This means that he is in charge of history and of how the world's destiny unfolds. You know that in C.S. Lewis, in his Narnia stories, the Redeemer is pictured as a lion who lays down his life. They're, They're intertwined, this imagery. Question five on page 194 in our books says, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the ultimate victor and conqueror, has the power to banish all fear and to watch over you, remember he's the God who sees, with fierce protective love. Picture this literally. If you ever saw the viral YouTube image of a man walking a wilderness trail by himself, which he says he'll never do again, In this story, he spotted something on the trail moving, and he went to see what it was, and only at the last minute did he realize he was looking at three little cougar cubs. The rest of the video is about him backing away, clanging and making noises to scare off the mother who had come charging out from the brush and was after him. For a long period of time, he didn't know he was, if he was going to make it or not. He had this video going, showing this mother, making big displays, ready to get him if he came anywhere near her cubs. It's a wonderful image. And this is a cougar. Imagine a lioness. And think about how this image of Jesus, your Savior, might affect the way you face your fears. How does it affect our prayer life? We know from our study today that he sees us. He sees us with compassion. He exercises mercy toward us. Through his blood, he saves us from not only sin, but the guilt, all that leftover backwash that comes from the mistakes that we make and the regrets that we have. He gives us ammunition against the accuser who seeks to rob and destroy our joy and our peace, and who sheds doubt on how much God cares. Who sheds doubt on how his watching us is done in a compassionate way, waiting to extend mercy and forgiveness to us if we turn to him. And in those lonely times, especially with history unfolding as it is, it creates fearfulness. But we can turn to him who's in charge of all things and who cherishes us and fiercely protects us. We're his lambs who triumphed, who is triumphant and always will be. Just as last week we said he was, he is, 
and always will be. I love this picture. I don't know if you can see it. It's a Christmas card I got one day, and I, I framed it, and I keep it always in my office because it's the lion and the lamb that get to lie down peacefully together because of what Christ has accomplished. And there's our lion and our lamb, the lamb who gave us peace through his blood by reconciling us to the Father, and the lion who maintains that peace by fiercely protecting us. Next week we'll study some more names of God and we'll realize who we are in God the Father who we are as protected by the Lion of Judah, who we are as delivered from the sin issue through the Lamb of God, who we are in the night hours with the God who sees. See you next week.